Hey there, fourth trimester listeners. Our program today is proudly sponsored by Family Album, your secure haven for sharing baby photos and videos. Head over to the App Store today, search Family Album, one word, download the app, and start creating a legacy of love, one photo at a time. Hi, I'm Sarah Trott, and welcome to the Fourth Trimester Podcast. I'm a new mama, and this podcast is all about postpartum care for the first few months following birth, the time period also known as the fourth trimester. My postpartum doula, Esther Gallagher, is my co-host. She's a mother, grandmother, perinatal educator, birth and postpartum care provider. Fourth trimester care, our topic, is about the practical, emotional, and social support parents and baby require. And importantly, it helps set the tone for the continuing journey of parenting. trimester podcast. I'm Sarah Trott and I'm joined with my co-host Esther Gallagher and a special guest Sandra Lloyd. Sandra Lloyd is a depth hypnosis practitioner. I would like to say that just right off the bat Sandra's work has been awesomely uh, impactful for many many women. She's been working for decades with new moms and with parents and her work addresses specifically the emotional challenges that arise prenatally and during birth and just throughout parenthood. Um, really connecting between the experiences that people have in their own lives as children and how becoming a parent brings those issues up and uh, really proactively addresses those issues so that there's a better relationship for the entire family throughout their lives, which is hugely important. And it's something I would encourage all of our listeners and new parents and their friends to think about as they prepare to become parents for the first time or at any point, frankly. So. Anyhow, I want to start off um, with talking with Sandra and Esther here just about how does the work that you do help prepare people to become parents? Depth hypnosis is a um, modality that allows us to kind of bypass the rational mind. It allows us to go really deeply into the wisdom and the information that the body has held and that the body is holding this information perhaps if I can go way out there from another lifetime, another experience of many lifetimes, but definitely from this lifetime. So we all carry with us um, experiences of hurts or wounds or um, real trauma of um, accidents, death in a family, loss of a parent, divorce, um, uh, cruelty of a parent abuse on all levels. Um, these things are carried with us. And for women, when they become pregnant, uh, and even couples, you know, uh, are looking at their pregnancy and stepping into parenthood, these things will come up whether they want to admit it or not. So I would rather address it prenatally so that a mom and her partner could go through um, the birth in a more seamless way and a more easeful way and that she could actually welcome the passage of a baby into the world and actually stepping into her role as a parent. If we've had very um, damaged uh, relationships with our own mothers, um, we only learn how to mother through our own mother. We don't learn from our neighbor's mother how to be a mother. Um, we still hold all of that information in us. And until we can actually address it, look at it, clear it, heal it, it's going to be difficult for us to step into motherhood in a way that might be unique to ourselves and empowering. Yeah, I mean, I always, I always think that uh, whatever it is we can connect with and, and acknowledge and do the work of clearing, you know, clearing just meaning coming to terms with and perhaps releasing. Maybe it's a through a compassion practice, working with a spiritual guide who will help us walk through into a different reality. That's going to bring some ease to the postpartum transition as well. I mean, first a big transition that dumps you right into the next transition. Uh, <laughs> things keep moving after you have a baby suddenly become static in any way. Um, 
but I, I think about uh, getting through adolescence with my children and then getting through young adulthood with my children. I mean, you're a parent for the rest of your life once you've given birth, no matter what it looks like. And so um, this preparatory work seems to me has the potential to really serve a person throughout that whole span. I can, I can just talk personally from my own life. Of, my son's a grown man now. Um, but I stepped into motherhood uh, with a firm belief that I was not going to be like my mother. And, um, and the truth is I wasn't. But it took such great effort um, for me to, to really reexamine who I was as a woman and as a mother at every age that my son Became. So in a way, I was re-raising myself when he was one year old or two years old. It was a chance for me to like really dig deeply into who I was at that age. And it was, uh, it was a lot of work. <laughs> um, I also suffered from um, powerful, deep postpartum depression. And there wasn't a name for it, um, to my knowledge, at that time. And I was a person who um, who had a network of women friends. We were all pregnant together. We were kind of big, the big four we called ourselves. And um, I was the one who would sit in my room, rocking, staring at the wall, crying like, "What have I done?" And I loved my son dearly, and did then, and, and stayed home from work and for quite a long time, and breastfed him and did all the right things. But inside I was wondering why I felt so badly when I was supposed to be really happy to be a mother. So those places are in me, you know, and I can look back at how I was mothered and I just have the stories of what my mother told me about how she mothered me, but it doesn't fit with how my life experience with her is. So those are the things that I needed to heal over my lifetime. And, um, and spent a lot of years in therapy <laughs> working on that. So I'm really glad that I now have a, a way to work with people that is profoundly um, easeful in a lot of ways, um, helps people move through their issues really rapidly and can heal on a really deep level so that you don't have to spend 30 years sitting in a therapist's office. <laughs> I love that so much. So my baby's almost one years old, so it's not like it's been that long ago for me that I was going through um, just the all of the preparation for having my first baby, right? Like, I've just been through this. And, you know, I got all kinds of material from the hospital and from my doctor, information about how to take care of the baby, information about how to take care of um, the birth, myself during the birth, so much about the birth and the hospital at the birth. Uh, and then... Um, just nothing really about me, not a whole lot of information about how to take care of myself. And I don't think anyone ever mentioned like, once some of these ideas that you're talking about. And it sounds so, so valuable, so valuable. It's a, a sort of a self-care aspect, but it's also taking care of the baby too, right? Because it's, uh, make, it sounds like what you're saying is it's, there's a benefit to making peace. Yes. And I think that we also... Um, it's my experience with even um, more than a few of my birth clients who, you know, are excited to be pregnant but haven't really considered why they want to be parents or how they want to be parents or yeah or or yes how that even looks. Mm -hmm. They're they're in the pregnancy but they're not in what they're stepping into at all. And so I think that's I think that's important. I think you need to start to examine. How do I want my child to feel? How do I want to be? What in me needs to shift or change? What in me needs healing that will allow me to more fully step into the way I want a parent, um, as opposed to all those wild books out there that have so much information that just make people crazy. So I was listening um, just this morning to uh, Thich Nhat Pong do a lecture. I'm not sure what you would call it. Uh, about reconciliation. He was speaking specifically using an example about reconciling with our own parents. And I remember you saying earlier, Sandra, that, you know, this, this work has deep roots in Buddhism. 
and uh, and I'm not a sophisticated Buddhist per se, but I think so much of what comes to us through Buddhism from the East to the West is compassion practice. And I think the first step is so often is just uncovering what it is we need to be compassionate about and who then towards. <laughs> um, and what was so interesting about his talk was the reflexivity, right? That practice of seeing yourself as the child and sending your compassion to you as the child, the vulnerable, hurt child. And then seeing perhaps your own parent as that five-year-old kid too, at some point, also vulnerable, also uh, being affected by whatever these things are. And we know how generational they are, which is why it's so um, interesting to hear you say, you know, past lives, right? Like in a sense, we hold existentially, you know, generations of love and harm, right? Like all the love that we inherit from our parents, they inherited, and all the harm as well. So having a practice that sits us down and asks us to go deep right now, I think is really very beneficial. And I think it's the beginning. You know, I think it's the beginning of, of how to understand self-care. You know, I think there's that word circulates in American culture a lot now. And yet it means things like um, get enough sleep, exercise, you know, eat right. <laughs> um, rarely do I see that extend to and do your work of, of healing the generations of trauma that you've inherited. Exactly. Um, actually, that's a very interesting um, example with the meditation you were describing, um, because that is a piece that's very much related to shamanism and the work of soul retrieval that is one of the um, foundations in death hypnosis, is really uh, allowing yourself to, when we, when, we, when we work with the body, we're looking for where is the trauma held in the body. And then we do something called regression, which is moving backwards in your life to the point in time where the, where whatever incident or experience happened that is the core of the problem that's exhibiting itself today. Uh, whether it's a panic attack or depression or anxiety or self hatred or whatever it is, we, we go back to where the core is because the body knows where it is. And when you're in that deeply relaxed state of hypnosis, you're able to allow yourself to travel back through time in your life. And it doesn't so much matter even whether the, the incident is um, all real or fully recalled exactly as it was because the body only remembers how it felt to the person. And so that experience is held in its suffering and pain. So when we are able to do this beautiful thing you just described, Esther, of really seeing the younger you and being able to bring the adult you into that experience to have compassion and to express in whatever way how you feel towards that younger self. And then, you know, how the younger self be able to say what it felt, what he or she felt, and how, you know, how helpless or alone or angry or upset or lost or whatever the experience is, mm -hmm. um, you know, to be able to express that so the adult you can really stand and maybe for the first time have that younger part of you heard in a way it's never been heard before. Mm -hmm. And um, eventually, you know, with, through that dialogue, maybe even um, confronting, having the adult you confront um, the parent or uh, person who harmed you to be able to stand up to them in that way in this deeply relaxed, um, what we call non-ordinary reality. And eventually then we're able to fold or bring that younger child because it seems like the younger self, it starts to feel better. They're like, wow, someone heard me. I was mm. heard in this time that I've never been heard. And then wants to get closer to the adult self when we actually um, have a practice of folding the child into the heart of the adult. And it, this is a retrieving of a soul part that was lost. 
and the person feels much more complete. And some people have very subtle um, reactions to this over time or experiences of it. And some people have very profound changes, like right away in their life, where they they realize, like, you know, I don't need this person in my life anymore, and I'm not going to act that way in that experience again. I mean, they just find themselves acting different because parts of who they really are has been, have been returned to them. Well, and one can imagine then it, there's a learning in that moment, right? There's a learning, the thing that was missing. And I think so often, and certainly my experience as, as a mother, that so often encountering an issue that might arise between my children and me, or just an issue that arises, right? Um, so often my experience was one of lacking resource. Like, I have no idea how to behave in this situation. There was, I'm looking back into my childhood for something that looked like this situation. And while I know it happened, something like this, there was no resource. There was nothing. I was, I was literally voiceless because there was nowhere to go with it. And so something like that leading to, oh, and if I feel voiceless, I feel the need for a voice. And if I feel the need for a voice, I need the feel the need for some ears on the other side of that voice on and on, right? So we're using the imagination to develop an interaction for ourselves that we did not experience and bringing that forward into a moment with our children, perhaps, that means, oh, now there's some resource. I've imagined a way to be in this situation with these people I love that I didn't actually get to experience for myself at that developmental stage, perhaps. Um, To me, that's so generative and so um, resourced and resourceful uh, that I I really like that aspect of of this kind of work. And and also what you're talking about is... um... You know what I heard in, in the, again in that story about the meditation um, with the younger self is is this place of um, it, it's really a way to foster self love um, because it takes a lot for the the adult to actually love that child self of of themselves mm-hmm. and sometimes I have clients who have no compassion mm-hmm. for that younger one um, and are actually acting exactly like their parents behaved to that younger self. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot more work to do. Um, I think another piece of this work that we're talking about and what happens for people, we can't forget um, the experience of birth from others. And this is an arena where um, not only soul parts, as we call them, traumatic events can happen in a birth where parts of the mother of her soul, of her essence, actually leave because of the experience. This is what we know happens in car accidents that people, you know, in, in a, an experience of a sudden um, traumatic experience, part of the, of the soul says, I need to get out of here to survive. And so it leaves and um, it has to be returned at some point. Only we in our culture don't have a method for doing that, which is why, this work that I do um, in depth hypnosis is so powerful because we actually can use the ancient shamanic practices in this very modern context to be able to bring back the lost parts of ourself that are really the essence of who we are. Um, so the other piece in this besides the soul loss is loss of power. And this is one of the primary things that as, as a person who's worked with birthing women for many years, you know, so much wanting to help her hold her power in the birth experience. Still, we find there's so many ways that a doctor, a nurse, a midwife, a partner, a family member can try and steal the power that's really meant to be dedicated to the mother. And this is why I use a practice called Journey to the Great Mother in in uh, the therapeutic context. 
and it's also um, an adaptation of a journey I do for a person to connect with a source of power within themselves for the the, the length of time that they're in therapy with me. It's a, and it's something they can use in their lives, but it's just connecting with a knowing wise part of themselves. And so when the mother comes into the birth setting connected to this source of limitless energy and the great mother could be animal or plant form or human form or mythological form or angelic form, or it could be light or sound or just essence or feeling, you know, a sixth sense feeling of a presence. When you have that connection and you're grounded in it and you're connected to your baby, you're good, you know, and if the person who's supporting you in birth is also connected to their um, their experience of the great mother, you have a lot going on in that birth room that's on a level of, of energy that can't be seen, um, but can be felt and known. And so that's what I trust in that environment. And that's what my clients learn to trust is their connection to their deep knowing and the limitless source of energy that can help them when they're too tired, um, afraid, not sure what decision to make. Um, we have that other resource that's beyond words. And that kind of connection with the great mother also carries them into the postpartum period where they can begin on a deep level to sort through all the things they need to sort through and have an understanding of what it means for them to stand in their power as a mother connected fully to themselves and, and feel free to say no to the things that don't, um, that don't feel connected to their essence, that don't feel like the right choices for them to make. <laughs> I have so many questions for you at this point. <laughs> um, it sounds like what you're saying is that part of the healing process that women are able to do, or arguably like even like adoptive parents, like any, anyone who's about to become a parent, all of that healing that people do before they become a new parent can help enable this empowerment that you're referring to. And while it may not be necessary to do all the self-reflection, wow, it helps. It really helps. And then uh, a new kind of trust in oneself is able to exist and trust that they can listen to themselves and listen to that, that power in whatever shape or form it takes. Right. And the beauty of this work is that it's not a lot of talking. It's really not a talk therapy. I mean, there's some discussion in the first session of, you know, me understanding their history, mm -hmm. but it's not talk therapy because we're moving beyond the conscious mind. We're moving beyond the ego. We're moving, we can't understand it on, that level. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the use of the hypnosis, the settling down into the deeply relaxed state, with the mind really quiet, which is frankly really useful for birth anyway and parenthood, mm -hmm. um, that mindfulness, that state of mindfulness, um, it just allows you to let the information come forward. Whether, and it often makes, you know, it may make no sense in the moment, like why am I feeling this in my liver, you know? But there's a story there, so we, we keep searching for what that story is and what that picture is, and that leads us to the time and place um, where an incident occurred that, that, that kind of gets locked there. I mean, we can't mentally decide, I don't believe, I'm going to be a different kind of mother, because I tried to do that, and I had to learn how to unravel mm -hmm. the parts of me that were wounded and had to unravel and, and have some healing. Mm -hmm. to be able to step forward and not react as my mother reacted um, yeah. towards me. And um, this, you know, this is the foundation that Esther was talking about of Buddhism. You know, what we bring from Buddhism into the depth hypnosis work is, you know, the principles of attraction. You know, what are we attracted to? You know, what kind of partner do we pick? What kind of person do we pick to father our child or mother our child? Um, you know, what, um, you know, what, what are we, um, what do we avoid? You know, like me saying, I will never be like my mother. Like that's like a big red flag <laughs> because that tells me how much charge there is for me about that. And there's something I need to look at. And the other place is just called wrong knowing or ignorance. And it just means we're not even aware of the ways that we're working, the ways that we're moving through the world. It's sort of an unconsciousness. 
And once we bring forth the knowing, it's pretty hard to not take responsibility for your behavior and your actions and to, to decide whether or not you want to make a change. What's a practical example of something that someone might have experienced as a child that then comes up later? I think people who um, have had a lot of criticism um, that that they have to behave or be in a certain way, um, that there's, you know, your mother's way or the highway, sort of, um, you carry that. So your self-esteem as a mother, your ability to um, just walking through life without kind of pointing the finger at yourself all the time. I think for me, that was the experience in postpartum depression was feeling like there was what was wrong with me because everybody else in the world was had to be a happy mother. And, you know, I was happy to have my son, but I was unhappy with mothering. Um, I was profoundly wounded there. So I think that it's the highly critical parent, um, um, the, you know, there's many people who suffer from abuse on all levels in their families. Uh, the person who was the fourth child or fifth child in the family and didn't get a lot of parenting, you know, they got it from their siblings. Like, how do they know how to be a mother? I mean, it's, it's, it's really, it, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> I was just reading the introduction of a book called Parenting from Within. And there was someone who gave an anecdote about uh, feeling very stressed when they heard a baby cry. Mm -hmm. And, and there was something there and he couldn't, he kept trying to think like, Oh, what is it? What was it in my, in my past that like when I was crying and, and he couldn't remember himself crying, but he was like, there's probably something there. And he later discovered after months of kind of pondering this, cause he knew he was like more stressed than typical hearing his son cry as an infant. He remembered that we, when he had a doctoral internship at the UCLA Pediatric Center, that he experienced some stress associated with helping care for sick infants. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really interesting book so far, and I can't wait to finish it. And I encourage our, our listeners to pick that one up, mm -hmm. too. But I thought that was interesting. Is that kind of the kind of thing that you address with people? I would probably be, I would be very inclined to take that experience and go back even farther into that man's life because I, you know, what's coming up for me and I'm not, I don't know him, but I would be curious because it's the curiosity that always leads me there. Mm -hmm. Like what in his um, childhood, in even in when he was in his mother's womb, what was happening mm -hmm. um, to him? Because um, the words that just kind of came forward for me right now were helplessness. You know? Yeah. Um, he said and, that in the book. And that's yep. what it felt like to me. Like, And so either as a child that he cried and nobody came, mm -hmm. that he didn't know how to calm or or couldn't be with a crying child who just was crying because that's what they had to do. Um, and and his compassion was actually more than enough, probably, mm -hmm. for, that, for those babies. Um, but it was definitely triggering to him, it feels like to me, that helplessness. Yeah. And that maybe nobody is here for you. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's fascinating. Hey, fellow parents. Can we take a moment to reflect on the joyous chaos that is parenthood? You know those days when our hearts swell with love at the sight of our little ones and we're bursting at the seams to share every adorable moment with the world. But let's be real. Some things are better kept in the family. And your loved ones who matter the most aren't always close by. And they might not be that tech savvy either. So how can you easily share your baby's beautiful growth with loved ones while keeping your precious memories secure? I remember the frustration of trying to use some of the big tech photo solutions, only to find they fell short of what I needed. That's when I stumbled upon something truly remarkable, the Family Album Map. The Family Album Map was created to give parents a secure and easy way to share photos and videos with loved ones. It's an orderly and totally secure haven for your family's personal memories. I love that there's no third-party ads, no unwanted eyes, unlimited storage, and that it's totally free. So to all the parents who are out there still trying to use other messaging apps for your kids' photos, it's time to level up your family photo game with a free photo sharing app. Head over to the app store today, search family album, one word, download the app and start creating a legacy of love one photo at a time. Okay. So let's, let's pretend like we are about to have our first baby <laughs> and we're listening to ourselves right now. Um, I know something that is a huge temptation for me is having lists 
and wanting to believe that if I do these things, then my birth will be perfect and I'll be a perfect mom, which obviously don't exist, but it's so attractive as an idea. So if I were hearing this, I would think I've got to do my depth hypnosis. I've got to work through 100% of my issues before I have my baby. Otherwise, this is going to be a problem. So what could our listeners do, whether or not they've had their first baby, but what can they do now to sort of practically start thinking about these things and prepare? Maybe they have access to you or someone like you, or maybe they don't. And is it okay not to fix everything? Absolutely. Well, we we are on a continuum. <laughs> Remember, um, we've inherited <laughs> generations, yeah. right? So whatever's salient for us as individuals is the thing. Maybe that's why we're here, is there's this one thing generationally that we can clear for the next generation. I mean, I think that's one way to think of this. Rather than what we do tend to do, which is, you know, okay, another thing on my list and I've got to ace this thing, right? No, that's not existentially or even from the Buddhist perspective, what's going to happen. That's mm-hmm. not reality. Reality is that maybe we address the thing in front of us, right? If we don't even know what's in front of us, then that's an interesting thing, right? That gives us, I mean, I, I imagine that would be like, okay, I know there's something, just don't know what it is. Perfect kind of way to bring us into, uh, you know, the purview of a Sandra Lloyd or, and I can name several others, but, um, uh, you know, somebody who can just sit with us and say, okay, let's drop down and find out what that is. Might not be just one thing, but maybe it is. Maybe it's one big thing. And that's going to be the thing that we in our lifetimes address and that changes things for the next generation. So I, I like I like to think of it that way, too. Um, You've mentioned this a couple of times, and I and I, it, it's important to kind of highlight it that we do carry the DNA of our ancestors. We also carry the trauma. And there's been many studies. I just attended a conference on trauma recently, and just Holocaust victims, and um, you know that that trauma is passed cellularly through to the next um, generations, and we have trauma that comes through a whole family through Mm -hmm. many, many generations. Mm -hmm. So this work is an opportunity to do that piece of the work here in this lifetime. Um, Certainly I'm not looking at, boy, I wish I could just say, yeah, I can clear everybody's stuff. (laughs) Um, People come to me with what's presenting. I'm terrified of childbirth. Mm -hmm. I'm scared to be a mother. Um, I'm afraid this is going to ruin my marriage when we have a child. Um, I'm just, I'm having panic attacks. I can't sleep. Um, you know, whatever, there's usually something that's presenting Mm -hmm. in the moment that the person is addressing. And that's usually not the, the thing, the issue that we find, you know, underneath it. We're looking for where is the source of this fear, this distortion of the perception, this, um, disconnect from their deep resources of themselves Mm -hmm. and what needs healing. And and that's what this modality does. So, you know, it's whatever is on your mind, so to speak, whatever seems to be intruding in your life that's making things hard. Maybe you're fighting with your partner. Maybe, um, yeah, maybe it's just you're afraid. Like, I don't, or or how am I going to do this? Or you just feel overwhelmed. Like, this is too much. I have my job. I have my a baby that's going to come soon. I don't know how we're going to survive. How am I going to do this? How can I put it all together? And Not only we, that, but don't you think there's a lot of moms, um, I, I can speak personally, but I also think this is a very common experience for moms that they don't anticipate necessarily, but then they find themselves in it, which is now there's a baby in my arms. I have all the responsibility and none of the resource and none of the empowerment, as you're calling it, which I love. Um, but, but suddenly while I had that baby bump, I was getting all kinds of strokes and attention. And now I'm a fucking nothing, excuse my French, like (laughs) I'm nothing. Uh, and I'm especially nothing if my baby isn't perfect and everything doesn't look good. So I think there's a soul retrieval aspect to this that, that I think 
mothers in this culture generationally have been traumatized by, which is becoming annihilated in a sense, uh, very soon after giving birth. Um, and, and so, yeah, you know, <laughs> you may or may not know that's coming on a, you know, on a conscious level, but I bet you do know in your body somewhere, you know, because again, that's generational. Um, so maybe just congratulations for even considering these concepts. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. So for being aware that there's, that something needs attention mm -hmm. and, and, you know, there usually is something that's presenting, um, for people, um, in order for them to even seek out help of this sort. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the, one of the first questions that I ask when someone comes into a session is, what do you know about your birth? What have you been told about your birth? You know, what did your parents have a particular sex they wanted to have? You know, um, were there miscarriages before you were born? So this is information that's really potent and important. And it, it starts to lay a foundation for me to work with of understanding themes through lifetimes where people have experienced trauma and we can, that that's like a template that I form to be able to work from as we start to go address an issue. So to me, being able to have someone heal some, uh, some issues that have been with them for a lifetime, um, for this lifetime, for sure. Um, that may even go back to their own birth. Someone who was born by cesarean, um, someone that was pulled out by forceps, um, someone who doesn't remember their other parent being present. Uh, we remember our birth. Someone big, who may have lost a twin. Big surprise. Someone who may have lost a twin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, all these, you know, we're conscious beings in the womb. So, and someone who has heard their parents fighting when, when they were in the womb and misunderstands. There's actually tons of writings about this and research about this, that it's not like to blame the mother, you know, if everything isn't perfect when you're pregnant, but the child just doesn't understand what all the noise is about and thinks it's about them because mm -hmm. they're experiencing the adrenaline, all the emotional chemistry of their mother, uh, a mother who's like, oh my God, I've got five kids and I'm having another one. Well, that baby knows that. Mm -hmm. And so we have to have conversations with our babies. Like, hi, you know, I'm upset today. It's not you. Mm -hmm. You know, like I'm just having a hard time, Yeah, you know, which is like something you can use on the other side too. When your children are here, like, yes, I'm just not good today. It's not you. Like I'm a mess <laughs> and I'm, yeah. I'm not very well put together. Um, and, yeah. and I'm learning how to take better care of myself day by day. Mm -hmm. I invite you to as well. Exactly. What might we do together today? Yeah, that would be nourishing and supportive, you know. What can our listeners do on their own? Well, what, great question. Um, a foundational piece of death hypnosis is that I'm using shamanic tools, but I'm actually teaching you how to be your own shaman. So you're actually going to learn the, the, the process of how to journey, how to connect with the guide that the guidance that you have found in the sessions so that you can on your own actually go with your questions, your issues to work with your inner guidance to, to help you problem solve in this, in this reality. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very useful. So it, it's, it's, this work isn't designed for you to be kept as a client for the next 10 years. It, can come if you'd like, I'd be happy, but, but it's really to teach you tools that you can use um, and resource yourself and then maybe come back to visit me at various points in times when you get stuck and need, need more understanding and support around it. So we're actually teaching you how to help yourself and how to clear um, issues for yourself. It's almost like the way we are raised is an instruction booklet that we store. And what happens is that unless someone is aware of the, of those things, they will go through life living by that instruction booklet as a default. And so part of the work that we can do as parents is, is question that set of instructions, uh, say this part I agree with and I really like, so I'm going to keep it. It's wonderful. Make it a tradition. Some parts maybe I don't like so much, 
And there's an opportunity for parents to proactively have more awareness around the way they behave uh, and treat themselves and their children. Um, but it takes a lot of work to kind of, I think, dig into what are those, what are those defaults? It occurs to me that one thing that um, parents, any parent could do mm-hmm. is um, keep a little journal. And by that, I'm not talking about a baby book. I'm not talking about the milestones for the child or, you know, uh, what the color of their pee and poop is. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm talking about this is the experience I'm having today. You know, these, these are the things that were challenging Mm -hmm. for me. Um, Maybe some thought and writing put into, I wonder what I might have needed that would have been felt supportive and empowering in this situation today. Mm -hmm. You know, Um, those sorts of simple, simple journaling tools Part of what I like about the this is that a journal is, in a way, a journey, right? It's we're we're, we're actually um, documenting our journey as it's happening or after it's happening. But even so, that can be a powerful imaginative tool if you get to be three weeks out or two weeks out or one week out, and you look back and go. Oh, I'm seeing this. I'm seeing the trajectory that I take. I'm seeing the feelings that arise, you know, especially if one's able to, uh, you know, name. Oh, I felt really sad. Oh, I felt angry in that moment. Oh, I felt uh, kind of desperate and anxious. If, if one can actually be naming feelings as they arrive, naming how the body feels, mm-hmm. like just from a sensory perception point of view. Oh, I had pain in my knee and my neck hurt, you know, but boy, my arms were really free and loose and nice, you know, that felt really good. Um, uh, I, th- I think there are elements in all of that, that hearken to all the work that Sandra does, um, that can make things available to us that we wouldn't have thought might be available to us as we go along. And, you know, it's a little, you know, you, you use the instruction booklet um, uh, analogy. Uh, Annie Lamont had a book titled Operating Instructions, and it's all about her her trajectory as a single mom, you know, um, and the world she was living in and her relationship to her parents. And just it's funny and fun, too. I mean, you know, the other part of all of this is that um, while there is trauma, there are things that we want to address. There's also like, can we identify the joy without denying the difficulty, mm-hmm. right? That's a different thing than what the prescription in our culture is, which is you're on, you only get joy. <laughs> if you feel like shit, there's something really wrong with you, you know, and we don't want to hear it. We do not want to hear about. That's not true in the world, right? It's not true um, that there's only joy. Um, It's also not true that we don't want to hear about it. But it's a strong message that that somehow we pick up somewhere along the line. Um, I think, you know, being the person who can write it down and hear it is a step in the right direction. So that that journal leads us into a a relationship to our own journey as a parent, which is lifelong. You know, we're always going to be a parent. Um, So uh, it's just a suggestion (laughs) along the lines of what can we do? Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the biggest challenges with um, new moms in particular is just the, the isolation. You know, and, and I think some of that comes from the fact that there's such a short period of time that women have to be home, to be a mother, you know, in those early weeks, this fourth trimester you talk about, um, and then they're back at work. So when I look at that, like, that's so unrealistic that one could work on the issues that are coming forward in three months' time, get that all banged out. Mm-hmm. It doesn't happen that way. I mean, you're barely surviving. Um and so, you know, the, the good news is we have postpartum doulas, we have people that can support 
you know, new mothers, and there's certainly more and more new mothers groups arising here in the Bay Area. And and that's a helpful tool just for you to get out and see that you're not the only one struggling or that your breastfeeding issues are different from somebody else's or you see a mother who's got a three-month-old and you've got a one-month-old and they actually made it through <laughs> this this period where you feel like I'm going to lose my mind. There's no way that I'm ever going to be myself again. Um, you know, one of the most profound places that I'm aware of in stepping into motherhood is it's the beginning of learning to be of service to another human being. It's just where we learn about service. We don't, I don't care where you've done it before. This is where you learn it because you're completely responsible 24 seven for this beautiful life you brought into the world. And you have to dig pretty deep for that. And there's lots of planning that I see going on. You know, we're going to get, the night nanny, the day nanny, the this nanny, the this do it. I mean, that people are not wanting to step into that service very much, and um, I I'm concerned about that. I feel a lot of concern about that. You're raising a human being, you're bringing this person into the world, and you need to be present. Yeah, and I I just have something very come up very strongly for for. In reference to this and that, you know, we are, of course, because of the nature of this podcast and how we've evolved it, addressing specifically uh, mothers here. Um, but I, I want to give a shout out to partners <laughs> based on exactly what Sandra just said. You know, it's it's difficult. And for partners, it's a little easier to step away. However, I think often stepping away is the thing partners don't want to do, but don't know what else to do. Right. And, and that's based on the the term abandonment came up very strongly for me as you were talking. Um, uh, You know, if you were a child who, whose parents couldn't show up for you and now you're a parent and your child's doing things that are challenging, uh, and the thing to do is to step away, that leaves a legacy as well, right? Sorry. That abandonment is the word we haven't used much of, but I think it's out there. I think it's in here, and I think um, it's, a real, uh, it's a real cultural issue that we don't talk about. We abandon whole groups of society as a culture, regularly. It's part of our zeitgeist that we're not able to really grab hold of. Um, So, again, you know, I think uh, being partners in parenting is difficult. Um, There's always more to to look at. I ask these questions. I ask these questions when I have a birthing couple. the example I use is just is going to be a man, um, but you know this might be a dad who or dad to be who's got a hideous relationship with his father, doesn't speak to him, has been angry and separate from his father his whole life. His father was an alcoholic, um, was abusive, you know. So I look at and how are you, you know, where are you going to find the tools to be a different dad? It takes more than just saying. I don't want to be like my father. You, that man is kind of lost in that. It place. takes a lot more than yeah. being angry and pissed off. Exactly. So you have to, you know, these are the kinds of things that are that we look at. This, this is exactly what you're talking about. The instruction manual is, is we get our instruction manual is, you know, the 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 what we grew up with. You know, what birth order we're in. Um, how we were raised by our families. And that's how we know mothering and fathering. We need to ask, does this work? Did this work for me? What didn't work? And we can't, I don't feel we can just make those decisions on the intellectual plane. We can have a sense of like, I know this isn't working. Where do I go? I'm always going to want to go inside. I'm always going to want to go to beyond the words, back into the body, back into the places where you're holding what needs to be healed, back to the source, back to the origin 
of the issue of why you might not be able to be a mother who even wants to hold her baby. You know, I come from a family where my mother was not, I don't, I don't have a memory of my mother hugging me. I mean, she could tell me all she wanted to that she did, but I don't remember her being a touchy, huggy person as an adult. So it's hard for me to believe that she was that way when I was an infant. You know, so that's, that's how I learned to be in the world. And it's frankly the opposite of how I am. But, um, you know, it's things like that. It's like, that's a, I mean, simple, but not so simple thing of how I learned to be in the world, how I learned to be woman, mother, partner, whatever. Um, so we have to ask, and I don't think a lot of people ask, how do I really want to raise my child? And it's not in the books per se, you know, it, it's going back inside what resonates with me, what in me might prevent me from being the mother I fully want to be. And I'm all about looking at what's getting in your way, what needs clearing, what needs healing, what needs shifting and changing. Cause once you make those maneuvers, even on even on the one level we described earlier of the soul retrieval, even just doing one of those totally shifts how you hold your power and your energy and you start making different moves. It's very catalytic. Mm -hmm. You know, you might seek out different people to be around a different person to help you. Um, it, it's amazing how rapidly this work can make change. In you. It's so much easier to say, I don't want to be that or to criticize something that already exists. It's, um, that's so easy. What's difficult is saying, I will be, and then fill in the blank. This is the kind of parent I will be. Make a list of those mm -hmm. values or make a list of those, um, those practices and behaviors that you want to display. So I think that um, while it may be true that someone doesn't want to be X, Y, or Z like their mother or father, um, like filling that gap with something maybe is the part that just isn't happening. And so maybe you don't want to be like your, your parent and you say, I'm not going to be like my mom, but then you are like that anyway, because you haven't taken the time or made the effort to fill in that blank mm -hmm. and say, well, instead of that, I will be this. Mm -hmm. um, and probably which takes work. And probably the easiest practice to help bring that, you know, might be what Esther was referring to earlier is just the simple mm -hmm. um, meditative practice of giving love, you know, self-love towards, mm -hmm. you know, sending love to yourself, mm -hmm. compassionate practice of compassion for the self, as well as compassion out in the world. But it really starts with yourself. It's pretty uncomfortable for many people to listen to a meditation, say with someone like Jack Cornfield and where he's talking you through connecting with your own heart center and sending love into your own heart. It's difficult. It's when really that's not part of who you've been raised to be, yeah. you know, and that if we can't do that, we have no, we have very little resource for compassion to send out to all these other people in the world that we may not like very much, um, you know, that we need to send compassion to, to heal ourselves as Especially well. Especially if we perceive that they've harmed us in some way. I think loving the, you know, loving the self that goes to the gym and eats good food, <laughs> you know, all that, like that's easy. I know. <laughs> I, I love those things too. Loving the part of me that wasn't present for my kids at certain ages and stages, looking back, that's hard, you know. Mm -hmm. um, loving the part of me that felt weak and anxious and not up to the task, that's not easy. Loving the part of me that's still angry about the thing that so-and-so <laughs> did is not easy. Um, and when I can do that, I make a lot more room in my life for the people who may have harmed me to for, for reconciliation there and for a way to move into a broader, deeper love for them. Because I don't want to not love my parents or my children. I want that's what I want in this life is to love all my relations, <laughs> big and small, old and new. Um, uh, 
So it, you know, and, and I think, I think in our culture, we see compassion. We don't, we don't understand compassion at all. What we think about is excusing behavior. That's our idea, right? The idea is, oh, well, uncle Bud did that stupid ass thing. That's, you know, been bothering me all these years, but he's an alcoholic and he can't be held responsible. That is not the task here at all. That is not the task. The task is something very different. I want to read this little thing that I, I photographed on the sidewalk at Dolores Park. It, this is Rumi. Your task is not to seek for love, but merely to seek and find all the barriers within yourself that you have built against it. Yeah, compassion is a lead into that. Like, I look at that quote and I went, I think, How? <laughs> How am I gonna seek and find you know ah! <laughs> compassion is is that doorway um and that practice that builds up our capacity to um be in relationship. Another kind of thread to this is and I I use this one birthing with women and it's also kind of a piece of this work that I do with um the shamanic healing and the depth of gnosis is that we're, we forget this, but we are all connected. We're connected to everything, everything on the planet, animal, vegetable, mineral, human. Um, we're connected to the stars, to the planets, to all of it. And we forget that. So we get all stuck in our stuff. And so feeling that thread of connection, feeling the thread of the connection to our ancestors, to our mother, our grandmother, the great grandmother, all the way back. When a woman's giving birth, I like to remind her that there are thousands and thousands of women at this very moment in time around the planet giving birth right where you are. So if you can even step for a second into that power, you you, you can do no wrong here. You're going to be totally connected to your own um, essence as mother. You, you will feel it, and it will override, believe me, a lot of the stuff that might be in your way. So that's, you know, that's the work. If you're connected to your um, spirit allies through the depth of gnosis work, if you're connected to the great mother when you're birthing and when you're mothering your child, you have this connection to nature, to the earth, to the, to the planetary beings, to, you know, to all beings on the earth, all sentient beings on the earth too. And you can't help but feel that love and compassion. You know, oh, thank goodness I'm not, I'm not alone. And that is really the struggle for women in the birth environment and women, you know, women in stepping into mothering is we're just doing this by ourselves here in our house. Mm -hmm. And it becomes so small when really there's so much resource just feeling the, con the connection to the love and the compassion that's completely available to all of us at any moment in time. Love yourself. Forgive yourself. <laughs> think consciously and proactively about what kind of parent you want to be rather than what kind of parent you don't want to be. Mm -hmm. Great. I think this has been such a rich interview. Thanks, Sandra. Thank you. Sarah, thank, thank you, you so much. This, this time. Perfect. Anyone who's interested, uh, you can go online and you can Google Sandra Lloyd. You can go to her website, which is sandralloyd.net. Her last name is L-L-O-Y-D. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. You can subscribe to this podcast in order to hear more from us. Thank you for listening, everyone. And I hope you'll join us next time on the fourth trimester. The theme music on this podcast was created by Sean Trott. Hear more at soundcloud.com slash Sean Trott. Special thanks to my true loves, my husband, Ben, daughter, Penelope, and baby girl, Evelyn. Don't forget to share the fourth trimester podcast with any new and expecting parents. I'm Sarah Trott. Bye for now. Hello again. Bicycle man, I know you're doing all that you can. I wrote the song, simple and true. I wrote the song, I'll sing a song for you. You got your wheels, you got your gears. You ride around town without any fear. You got.
got your pedals, you got your brakes, you always wear your helmet for safety's sake. Song, I sing a song for you. 